So here we are for another episode, and we're very excited about today's guest. I met our guest through a mutual friend of ours that actually Sarah knows as well. We're all sort of connected. And this is Lori James. Hi, Lori. Hi, Louise. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so Thanks excited to have coming. this conversation with you. Yes. We're excited too. Thank you. So, and you were before we came on, Lu- Louise was saying that you guys were next to each other at a dinner party or something, and you both found out you're adopted. And then, yes. And, and it just was like magnetic. We just connected and we kept talking. And, you know, I didn't realize that she, you and she had your own podcast and we got onto that conversation and I shared that I wrote a book titled Sandwich, a memoir of holding on and letting go, which talks a lot about my adoption is one of the main through threads of my adoption um, and how I felt very, very alone most of my life. And through being sandwiched between raising four children. My mother fell ill when my kids were teens and preteens. And then my marriage started to fall apart through this eight year period of my life. I took this opportunity to introspectively look at what my part was in everything and went into therapy and did some extensive therapy, went away for a week at one point and really addressed some of that loneliness that I'd felt for most of my life. And how'd you know, tell us, tell us, well, I was going to tell us your adoption story. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Louise had a question. (laughs) No, I think it'll get answered. Yeah. So I was adopted at birth. It was a, it was a private adoption. I was born in 64 to give people a reference And like most of us that were born in the sixties, I was, you know, in the hospital for three days by myself. Right. I mean, you didn't really have much contact with your birth mother or your adopted mother until every, they checked everything out. So the nurses were pretty much the only ones that I had any contact with. And where was this? What state? Uh, California. So mm-hmm. I was born in Arcadia, California. Um, mm-hmm. and my parents lived in the city South of that in El Monte. Um, and I also have two older adopted siblings, two older brothers. I was the only daughter, but you know, one of the things that made me feel very alone was that I didn't feel like I belonged to my family, right? Uh-huh. I have two older brothers no, I don't look like either of them. As you can see, I'm blonde hair, blue eyed. My oldest brother is Italian, Mexican combo, dark skin. My middle brother is, um, he looked a, like similar, f- um, coloring, but not the same features. And I didn't look like my parents either. Um, and I didn't really feel like I fit into my school or my community at that time either. So I felt like I was a fish out of water for sure. Um, how did, how did your parents, um, come to adopt you and your three, your two brothers? So that's a very great question and a very interesting story because my parents had struggled to have their own child and my mother had, carried a child to eight months. And then she had a stillborn. The umbilical cord was wrapped around the baby's neck and strangled the baby. So she had to deliver a baby and it was a baby girl, um, which comes into later. I'll, I'll, as I go through my story, I'll share why that's important piece later on. Um, and so, and they had tried and back then they didn't have the fertility, um, advancements that they have nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so they, at that point just kind of gave up and it was really more my dad's issue. I think he had low sperm count. And so they just gave up. And I think that was really hard. I mean, I can only imagine my mother never talked about it, of course, about her stillborn. I knew of it mostly from getting bits and pieces from friends, um, 
and I think she may have mentioned it. I've actually gotten more information from my dad through the years than my mom around it. And I think that it was just because it, I think it was part the, the era, you know, we didn't talk about it, Mm -hmm. but also it was, um, so excruciatingly painful for her to, to talk about it. So, um, so anyways, so I'm adopted into this family. I'm trying to fit in going through my life. I'm a tomboy. Were you told that you were adopted? I don't remember being told. I just always remembered knowing uh, yeah, I have a that similar. I was adopted. So mm-hmm. one of those things. So I think I was probably told at some point along the way. And then I also kind of looked around my environment and said, nobody looks like me either. So I must be adopted. Um, and you know, there may have been little conversations of, you know, my parents' friends saying, Oh, you so lucky that you right. The lucky comments, (laughs) right. You're so lucky you're adopted into the family that wants you. And I did, there was a part of me that did feel very lucky, but like all kids who have an imagination, you're also wondering what my birth family might look like, you know, and it's always, I've listened to some of your podcasts and I so resonated with some of your past guests because it's like, yeah, I had this you know, fantasy that my (laughs) birth mother was, you know, this, you know, wealthy lived in this big, beautiful house and was going to come take me and sweep me away. Right. And (laughs) come back and say, she wanted me and I was going to live happily ever after. You know, and then, and that's not the, the reality of it. Um, and you know, there were times when I, would get me out of my parents and my oldest brother, um, when he turned about 12, he, so my oldest brother had struggles from the time he was in kindergarten, even before, but really when he got into school, struggled paying attention, struggled learning. Um, we believe that he was a drug baby. Mm. And he has addiction issues now, which also played into a lot of um, childhood trauma through my yeah. childhood. Adoptees are highly represented in addictive. Yeah. The, as substance abuse. I mean, yes, exactly. I, mm-hmm. I, yes, I'm aware of that. And he still struggles. Mm-hmm. You know, it started out with alcohol and, and pot or now like I, I I'm told we can't call it pot. It's weed. <laughs> my kids, my kids tell me my adult kids say, no mom, it's weed <laughs> anyway. So, um, and then it eventually, by the time he got into his twenties, it turned into, um, meth and he struggled with meth on and off for literally the last 20 years, been in and out of jail, been prison, um, abuse, like he's hit his girlfriend, there was some sexual abuse between the two. Well, he sexually abused me as a child too. Uh, So that mm. was the childhood trauma that I experienced as well. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, like I, I didn't really address it. I thought I had taken care of it, but I didn't really address it until I was in my forties, mid forties into my fifties. And now I'm 57. So I feel like I've, dealt with a lot of that and, and worked through a lot of it. I mean, there's always more layers that we can, can process and and understand when, when you went through, this is a little segue, but when you went through some of this trauma and then got help for it in the earlier years, did anyone bring up you being adopted or was that even really no, no, or your brother? They didn't just kind of like, no, not even and what's interesting is, so my first therapist I was with for about, I don't know, maybe six or seven years. 
And she never made that correlation. And that was like in my 40, like I started with her when I was 45 and I would see her separately. And then we, I would sometimes see her with my then husband. Um, but it re- it hasn't really been until the last four or five years that my therapist has really focused in on that and not only talked about that and the childhood trauma, but also just about the abandonment from birth, the abandonment of being in the hospital for the first three days without any real, you know, motherly or human touch and, and how that has, you know, early childbirth, early childhood trauma that you don't even know about. You don't even realize. Yeah. And, and that's recent. I mean, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm always curious if people, Sarah and I discuss that, if people are talking about it in therapy now to people and helping them, but Mm -hmm. hopefully it's changing. And I have several girlfriends that are therapists and I ask them that question, like, do you get a lot of training around this with adoptees when you're going through school? And they say very little, I mean, they do focus on it, but it's not a lot. Mm. Not as much as it should be. Right. Yeah. I completely agree. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of tied into, I think the whole birth industry for lack of a better term. Um, and this narrative of, of, I don't know. I just think there's a lot, it's a lot bigger than there's reasons why it's not being so focused on, I think keeping, keeping it status quo. And well, yeah, because then you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Why is it their problem? Right. (laughs) You know, like, and, and so, I mean, I'm being sarcastic, but I'm I'm completely in agreement. It's like, yeah, this is, this is, these are wounds that turn into physical ailments. They turn into Mm -hmm. mental and emotional ailments. They turn into mental illness. They turn into depression. You know, they turn into, you know, dysfunctional relationships, avoidance, you know, unhealthy attachment styles, all of it. It all plays into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what, and when you were going through this, so did you have reunion at all with your, like, did you look for your birth mother? Okay. I know so a little bit a, about this. Well, myself. wait, I, w- I want to go, hold yeah. on. I want to back up just a minute. <clears throat> did, did anybody know about the sexual abuse? Did mm. your parents know about it? Um, I did not tell my parents until I was in my early twenties. And, but all my friends, like all my girlfriends did not want to come over to my house because they, my brother creeped them out. And, um, and so I would always go over to their house. My mom would always say, why don't your friends come over here? I'm like, and I, of course I was like, oh, um, you know, we're going to go listen to music on their, you know, their records or whatever it was. I always made an excuse of why we were going to somebody else's house. And I did finally tell my parents when I was in my early twenties and, and I write about this in the book too. And my mom, my mom had a lot on her shoulders, um, not to only raising this very difficult child, you know, but she raised all three of us. She was a teacher. She worked, she went back and got her master's. She hadn't dealt with her own trauma of losing the stillborn because she, they didn't really have therapy back then. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of this that I'll go into now, and then I'll go to your, your, uh, question, um, Luis is I didn't find this out until my late forties. And my dad told me I was taking him to a doctor's appointment. I've been taking care of my parents for 14 years. My mom had dementia for 12 years and my dad's 93. So anyway, so taking my dad to a doctor's appointment. So this is whatever, you know, maybe nine years ago, eight years ago. And he says, he says, Lori, you know, he always thanks me. Thank you for taking, you know, thank you for, I don't know what I do without you. I said, 
you're welcome, dad. I'm happy to be here. Happy to help. He says, you know, we almost didn't have you. And I said, what do you mean? You almost didn't have me. He says, well, yeah, we adopted a little girl in between your two older brothers. And we had her for six months. What? And then the birth mother came and took her away. So by the time I came along, okay, I'm getting chills right now. Yeah. By the time I came along, my mom had not only lost a stillborn, an eight month old stillborn, she had cared for this little girl for six months. Then the baby got taken away. And then I'm the third child and I'm finally a girl. So the other piece of it is through most of my life and, you know, maybe I'm highly sensitive. Maybe it's just my intuition. I don't know, but I always felt this emotional distance from my mom. I'm sure. I'm sure she couldn't even connect with you. Yeah. And I knew I was loved and wanted, but I still just felt this disconnection from her. Like, like maybe you didn't have that bonding that, yeah. that is, yeah. yeah. Well, not that the is bonding a... from the beginning, right? not the bonding throughout, you know, just like it, it was almost like, you know, I'll get close to you and, and then that's close enough. Right. And then mm-hmm. I'll get close to you and that's close enough. And I think that that was her fear, her ultimate fear, whether conscious or unconscious of losing another baby girl. And how was she with your brothers? And yeah, and I wanted to, how's this, how was the middle brother? How, yeah. How- oh, he's, um, he's very angry. Yeah. <laughs> he, he basically divorced our family to, to, yeah. So he has his own trauma. I mean, so he has his own trauma that he hasn't dealt with. Yes. Yeah. Right. Three, totally. three children in trauma. Adoption right. is trauma. Relinquishment is. is trauma. It is no matter how good, you know, the family you go in, you're adopted into maybe it's trauma. It's trauma. It is Mm -hmm. a trauma. And when it's not talked about and, um, you don't feel safe to have a conversation or ask the questions that you're wondering about. Yeah. It's, I don't, you know, it's, it's just a really bad recipe. Yeah for a lot of struggles. So fast forward, I'm married. I have two kids. I'm answering your question, Louise, Mm -hmm. (laughs) about meeting my birth mother. Yeah. Um, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old at the time. And I'd always told my husband that I didn't want to find my birth mother. And that was just something I felt really strongly about. And I don't know, you know, I just, for me, it just felt like opening Pandora's box. And I just didn't know what I was going to open up. And even though my relationship with my mother wasn't perfect, I still loved her. And I also didn't want to betray her. Yeah. Mixed. Right. It was yes, constantly. So back in the mid nineties, we get internet access. (laughs) My husband at the time, Ooh, Google internet. Let's search something interesting. He searches for my birth mother. Did you know, how did you know her name? I was just, I had, because I, I applied for, so I had my adoption papers. I did get them from my birth parents. They gave them to me when I was an adult. And I also applied for, I I had unidentifiable information in the state of California. You can request that, which basically just gives like basic information. Like, I think that's every state does that. Yeah. Yeah. So I had that, but I had my adoption paper. So it had my birth mother's name on it. It was her real name. It was her, real, her name. real name. And so, and the last name, I won't say it because she likes to stay private because not everybody in her family knows. Um, but it was, it was a very, 
unique last name. I, as you know, as you can probably tell, I'm, you know, Swedish, I'm Scandinavian Mm -hmm. background. And, um, so my, I wake up one morning, I'm getting ready (laughs) and my husband says, um, I have something to tell you like, okay, brushing my teeth, whatever. I feel like that's a huge boundary thing when someone else searches for this, but go on. (laughs) That's bothering me. (laughs) And he says, I located your birth mother. I said, you did what? He says, yeah. And she'd like to meet you. Oh my goodness. Oh, he actually reached out to her. He outed you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, that's stepping a lot of lines. I flipped a chicken. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) be myself like such a major boundary crosser, but also like all Not surprised that- your divorce now, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so I was like, wonder if Sarah will say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took me a little longer to actually pull the trigger, but yeah. 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 And it, oh my God, it, talk about just I exploded. I was so angry. Didn't know what to do with my emotions. I go to a therapist that is somebody that my mom knew old school thinking. Oh yeah. Basically tells me that I should not make a big deal out of it. (laughs) And I was like, are you freaking, can I swear in here? Yep. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? This is a big deal and this isn't his place. He should not have done it. And the other piece is a key kind of sort of apologized, but didn't and kept making excuses like, well, why wouldn't you want to meet her? Don't you want to know her, our medical history for our kids, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, it's not your decision. It's not your place. So now she's sitting out there waiting for you to get in contact, which is going to be, that's big for her. I mean, it's just, it's just like, you know, this tumultuous storm inside me, I'm just like stirring. And what do I do? And I don't want to hurt my, my adopted mom, but I don't want to hurt my birth mom. And then how do I honor myself? And I'm pissed off at my husband. Like, oh yeah, and it really adoptees have to come to this at their own time. So that is just right. Ugh. I mean, so he knows what? he he knows <laughs> now that that was the beginning of the end, yeah. right? But he, yeah, it was so. So the bottom line is, I did end up meeting her. And um, what were the circumstances of your birth? So the circumstances of my birth were. She was a civilian working in for a military base, and she ended up having a relationship with somebody that was in the military. Um, and she got pregnant. She told him, and he said, "I'm sorry, I'm promised to somebody back at home. <laughs> I'm not willing to take any responsibility for this." Basically, I'm not willing to even marry you for three months or nine months or whatever it is until we can do this and, you know, put the baby up for adoption, nothing. So she went away to a, I don't know what you call it, a home, unwed mothers, an unwed mother home. Thank you. And stayed there until she gave birth to me. And then, you know, and then everything changed hands to my adopted family, my adopted parents. And how old was she when this happened? She was around 25, but you know, no prospects, wonderful family. I mean, I, I never met my 
her parents, I never met my birth mother's parents. They were passed away by the time I met her, but they seemed like very nice people. It seemed like she was raised in a nice family. She said she wanted to keep me. If it was her decision, she would have. Um, so, and that always makes you feel good. Um, but it was hard and I was not at the time when I met her, you know, I was in my mid thirties. I was not ready to have a relationship with her. I was working, you know, full-time essentially. I had two little kids. I, um, had my mother, I still had a relationship with my mother. I just didn't feel like I had room for her in my life. And so, and I, I was the only child she ever had. Oh, she didn't have any other children. She never had any other children. And did, so when you met her, okay. So you obviously went down the road of meeting her. Yes. And how, how did, um, what was that like? Because you did have the fish out of water so much. So it was almost like, I, it, it was another instance was, do I belong to you? Mm-hmm. I don't belong to you. I look like you. It was like meeting a distant aunt. Mm-hmm. And um, she's a lovely, lovely woman. And she's been nothing but kind to me and kind to my kids. But at the time, I just, because it wasn't on my terms and I didn't want it, I felt like it was forced. I felt an obligation yeah. to meet her, but I felt like the whole situation was forced. And, and because I was her only child, she wanted to have a relationship with me. Yeah. Right. I mean, she was ready to just integrate into my life. And I was like, no, I am so not ready for this. And this is all pre cell phones. And, um, and I think it was even before I might've even had an email address. And so I said, I'd love to stay in touch with you once or twice a year, but I just am not ready to have anything more than that. And she was very respectful of that and, you know, kept, her distance. And it really has like, maybe over the last two years, she came to one of my book signings that I did at a book event or um, a bookstore down in Orange County, because she lives down in Orange County. And so she came to that, which was very nice. I, I do make an effort. I mean, I've always made an effort to have her since I am her only child, she doesn't have any grandchildren. I'd always get my kids together and have lunch with her around the holidays. So I did that. How do how do your kids feel about her? I mean, what do they call her? Like what, what's that? They call her by her first name. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, I mean, I feel like, you know, and I've always been very open with my kids about, you know, who she is and everything you know, even when they were little. Um, and you know, I think for them, it's like another distant relative. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like they, they don't feel this strong bond to her, but they don't oppose her either in any way. And so you never, uh, in these 20 some odd years, you never have been able to like open your heart to her more over the last couple of years. And I think part of that was my mom passed away about two and a half years ago. And, and I was finished writing my book, which is also was extremely cathartic. It was another form of healing for me because it's a memoir and it really helped me make sense of a lot of what happened in my life and put my emotions down in paper and tell it in a story. Mm -hmm. And so it really helped me make sense of what was going on. And that I think in a lot of ways, just to understand is very cathartic and very healing. And does, does your birth mother, um, does she, has she read the book and does she kind of understand 
Like, how does she feel about it? Is she hurt in general? She hasn't said much about the book, but I know she did read it. And I told her, I was, I told her before she read the book, I said, there's something in here that is going to be very hard for you to read because I write about the sexual abuse between my brother, or I should say not between my brother, that the sexual abuse from my brother. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want her to, and I talk about some of my struggles through my childhood and I didn't want her to feel the sense of responsibility of, I shouldn't have given her up. I shouldn't have done that. And if I wouldn't have, she wouldn't have experienced that. Right. Because we all are who we are because of our experiences and as awful as some of my experiences were, it's made me who I am today. Yeah. And so I didn't want her to feel guilty or shame, ashamed of what she did for giving me up for adoption. Cause she did what she to or f- at, at the time socially and financially and did she you know, carry that in her she, heart she wouldn't have did she carry that shame with her like is that part of the reason she didn't have other children or um that's not part of why she didn't have other children i think she did get married um the guy that she married had a couple of children that marriage didn't work out i think it was just she didn't find the right person mm-hmm. and that's why she didn't have more kids now, um, did you, um, do a search for your birth father or no, no, especially you, no interest in, no, especially after the fact that he, the way he treated my birth mother and like, no, I'm not going to take responsibility for this. And no, I'm promised to somebody else. So what am I going to do? Go disrupt his life and turn his <laughs> world upside down. That's the big question. For what benefit? Siblings. Have you, have you done the, um, the DNA? Like, are you on ancestry or any of this? Yeah. No, (laughs) but my kids, a couple of my kids have. And have they come found some unknown relatives? Obviously not on my part, but the funny thing is they did on my husband's part. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. And my husband's brother, just a little side note, my husband's brother (laughs) donated sperm back in when he was in college, which happens a lot. Right. Right. I think one of your, one of your guests that may have happened to, right. Is that if I recall, right. Yeah. And so uh, what, no, we didn't Louise. No, it was okay, maybe his, it was yeah. It, it maybe us. it was some meals. But anyway, so what so my kid's uncle, my husband's brother, donated sperm. And so that he has a child out there from that. Yeah. Oh, it's a story I told of a friend of mine. That's he had he knows like 20 kids from this one. Man, oh, really? but that's, that's going to come up more and more on this yeah. industry and DNA. Yeah, a lot of sure. people did that to make money. And so, I mean, I, had... if I had known about it, I probably would have given an egg away <laughs> back in the day. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it was always like scamming for something to make right. money. <laughs> <laughs> make easier, my eggs. <laughs> easier for the man even, right? right? I mean, make but... my rent, have a little party. Exactly. Money, whatever that's... it was. Read a magazine, get some cash. <laughs> What, and what, what about now, um, with your, did your adopted mom before she died? I know she had dementia, but did she ever know that you found your birth mother or your, yeah, did your and father? They, who's they actually met. Oh, so after I met my birth mother, um, and I, so, okay. So let me take a step back. So after that morning, when my then husband shares this fabulous news with me, (laughs) my, you know, mind goes, I need to tell my adopted mom. Oh my God. I don't want to have her find out on her own somehow. And she was leaving for a trip. She was a teacher. So as this was during the summer and she was about to leave on a, I don't know, four week trip or whatever with some of her girlfriends. And so I asked her out to lunch and I told her and she said, I'd like to meet the, your birth mother. 
And again, I was like, I don't, I'm unsure about this. Like, I don't know, do I really do this? And so I did. So maybe two months later, I had my birth mother came over and my adopted mother there and my kids and we kind of had tea and chatted and, and I, you know, that's big of your adopted mother. I mean, yeah, no, my adopted mother in so many ways, she was so awesome. I mean, you know, she just had a big heart and very loving, very compassionate person. She was a teacher. She loved kids. She helped start a preschool in uh, her church. I mean, she did a lot of really wonderful things. And then she Um, knew the trauma you went through by this time too. So, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, she also said, oh, don't worry about, you know, what your husband did. He didn't mean to hurt you kind of thing. (laughs) It was like, wait a minute. What about me? Like what? Yeah. You know, it's Hmm. like, well, Lori, everybody comes first. You should know this. I know <laughs> everybody as an adoptee, all the adults feelings come before ours. That's, yes, that's right. <laughs> the, uh, the birth mother, the adopted mother. Yeah, we're all, we're having to husband. juggle to make sure everyone feels okay. Right. No one gets hurt. <laughs> Just us. Right. Exactly. Another wound, another, yeah, wound. another oh. wound. I'm used to wounds. I can handle right. it. <laughs> Let me take the scab off that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, well, this has really been so yeah. great. And I want to, I I'm dying for you to do DNA and I know I am too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I know I can tell, but that's, you yeah. never, you know, you don't have to you don't have to reach out to anybody. You could just see what's out there. Yeah. I don't know. Here we are. I have a, I know. <laughs> have you Not guys both do. done it? Mm-hmm. Yes, we've both done it. And I had, by the way, so I had a lot of people in my inbox, you know, not my inbox, but my, you see my husband sort of did it for me as a present. And all of a sudden I'm like, Whoa, there's all these people I'm connected to. And they just kind of sat there for a long time. Like uh-huh. Sarah said, you don't have to Nobody has, a lot of people aren't active on there. You don't have to do anything about it, but it was fascinating to see. Yeah. And from, and, you know, I, I also did it because, um, I do want for my son to know just his, he's really interested in like his heritage on his dad's side. You know, they, they're very like, you know, Latin and they have the Spanish tie and the Italian, Mm. and they're all very proud of it and know exactly where their generations came from. And he's like, I want to know Yeah. that, that it's been kind of an interesting thing on that side. Yeah. And yeah. Sarah found a whole bunch of connections. Well, I did because my birth mother was also adopted. Oh, so wow. that was yeah. how I found her family was through ancestry. A few years wow, ago. Wow. That must yeah. have been interesting. It, it has been, it has been really, really interesting. interesting. I think out of the, so she was given up for adoption and out of, she was from Rochester, New York and out of the six kids that her birth mother came from four of them gave up kids for adoption. Wow. There's a lot of people out there to connect with. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, I think you're on a journey, but we're not encouraging. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we I were, am. but we're and not, you know what? Maybe at some point I'm just not quite there yet. Well, you've when been through a there. Lot. Yeah. Yeah. Let it, let us know when you're there. I will. And we can help. We can walk your hand through it. Yeah. Yes. I, I definitely will. I'll definitely take you up on that, that offer. Because... And we're going to stay in touch with you anyway, because we have our dear mutual friend and yes, when absolutely. Sarah comes to town, we're all going to go down to see you. Yes. I would love that. We'll that have an adoptee so lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Definitely. Let me know when you're in town. I would love that. That would be so much fun. We want her to come. Thank soon. you so much, Lori. Yeah. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you guys for having me. I love what you're doing. And if you two haven't told your stories, you need to interview each other. Oh, you know, so we did tell our stories at the very beginning of the podcast. So you're probably going backwards through it, but yeah, um, they've shifted a lot. So we're going to retell after this whole year of what we've been through and that's going to come out, Mm -hmm. you know, at the end of this season, we're going to kind of do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I'll yeah. keep listening for that though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I All love right. it. I love your podcast. I've enjoyed so many of the stories. Oh, and thank I you. love what you guys are talking about at the beginning too. Thank you. I love Thanks it. Thanks so much. Thank All you, right. Lori. Okay. See you soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.